This morning, we want to focus on that challenge in relation to a specific context. And it's a context which is both global and local, which is the relationship between indigenous peoples, indigenous cultures, indigenous societies, and non-indigenous peoples and societies. It's a very important challenge because it comes to us with history of tremendous difficulty, misunderstanding, prejudice, oppression, colonization, a focus on difference as meaning that one peoples are superior to others. And so we come into that challenge in a very particular and very serious context. Healing was mentioned this morning. It's a context that requires us to contemplate on healing, on the meanings of justice, on the meanings of equality, and ultimately on the meanings of oneness. We are very blessed to have a tremendous panel of speakers and leaders and scholars to take us through this exploration. Jacqueline Left Hand Bull, Chief Douglas White, and Dr. Lee Brown. They're each going to share with us some initial reflections for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then we're going to uh, have some time for a dialogue amongst them and a dialogue with you. And uh, you're welcome to uh, write down questions. There's people collecting them and they'll be brought up. And uh, time permitting, we'll, we'll have a discussion about, with them about some of the issues that have been raised. Our first speaker is Jacqueline Left Hand Bull. And over the last few months, I have uh, bothered this tremendously busy person uh, and uh, I'm so grateful that uh, she is here to share with us. I have asked her on numerous occasions how I should introduce her and she has avoided that in true humility, avoided that question in every way you can imagine. So I will let her introduce herself except to say and acknowledge, as you all know, that she is the chair of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and has bestowed extreme blessings on that Baha'i community and Baha'i communities around the world. So please welcome Jacqueline Left Handel. Well, good morning, friends. Yes, okay. I, I didn't want to do it myself. I was never sure about that. Thank you. Oh, well, again, good morning. Um, it's, it's a beautiful day, and what a beautiful beginning to this day. Uh, the very first thing I want to say is, um, is to draw our thoughts and our hearts to the Iran, those uh, dear brothers and sisters who at this hour are suffering in a prison in Iran, and if there is a crucible of reconciliation at this moment that must be there. And especially as tribal people, you know, most Iran is, is basically uh, a tribal nation. And to think that these people have uh, held fast to their beliefs and their commitment to advance civilization, I think our, our efforts itself can clearly be dedicated to their well-being. The next thing I want to say before I actually start is that I have called on Patricia Locke, who was my dearest friend, a few times over the past week or so when I really tried to focus down and um, think about this, because she and I actually had a, 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 a project we were working on when she passed, and that was to bring Nelson Mandela. We were going to devise a, a big national gathering of Indians in the United States and ask Nelson Mandela to come and to talk about the power of forgiveness, 
because we thought that it was that he was he had demonstrated it so well and had done much good was doing much good for his country and I think since we've seen more of that but at the time we felt this was probably the biggest hurdle and uh, again toward reconciliation it was my my thought originally and since then I realized um, how little I know and how I really am the last person who should be up here and uh, but when you're asked to do something you really should should not uh, decline. The other thing, the final thing before I get started is uh, on the next part is to, I really want you to see this dress, okay? So I'm gonna stand up. <laughs> and I wanna say the reason I'm, I'm wearing this is to honor uh, Deloria Bighorn because she wanted so much to have the most beautiful setting possible for this session for you and so that we could revel in it and we made we had grand plans we talked about grand plans at one point and of course you know budgets a, a consideration and it probably would have been money that came and went and could be better spent otherwise but um, but I'm wearing this dress because it is a piece of art and it really is is uh, more than that because I think of all my buckskin dresses I like this because when you get close you see it's made of patches and it's uh, it's a hundred years old and really, it, it symbolizes to me women in a lot of ways, my Indian sisters, because we took little and made much, made something beautiful and continue. So, uh, in Deloria's honor. So, um, let me start it at uh, the, biggest, the biggest privilege of my life, I think, was to be able to serve um, the blessed beauty, at least I tried, uh, in assignments. Uh, this, this doesn't seem like it was work at all, uh, to visit indigenous communities all throughout the Americas. Different assignments, different times, but essentially my job was to, um, to visit indigenous communities, to encourage them, to uh, love them, to shower them with love, and to study the writings of Baha'u'llah with them and the messages of the Universal House of Justice. Now, who gets that kind of privilege in their life? I mean, I, I can't tell you, you know, among memories are the Guaymi in Panama, you know, being there, going as far as the road went, and then seeing that where they were living, it was, there were no roads, so they walked to the meeting place, and learning that they had started their life as Baha'is in this, this huge, wonderful community, or this, I don't know that it's so large, but it's very deep Baha'i community of indigenous people, started their life with understanding the covenant and how important that was to um, reconciling who, or to understanding who they were and reconciling with the new world that was coming in on Panama. And then of course, traveling in the mountains of, of uh, among the Quechua in Aymara in Bolivia and meeting young people who had been persecuted for their faith. And yet they were, um, they came to Patricia and I and said, tell us, tell, tell me something. This one young woman said, tell me something that I can hold on to. Uh, when you're gone. And we were so surprised because we had not either been persecuted and yet she had been steadfast. And, and uh, we just told her to remember that she was a brave hearted woman for a good reason. And then among the Navajo in the Southwest where uh, because of the involvement of the friends and in in the Baha'is in that plan, the community of interest as we say, those people who are involved in Baha'i core activities, whether or not they're enrolled, but that community of interest is much larger than the actual Baha'i population. And as the, as the months and years go by, the line separating the two is, becomes irrelevant. And so when there are Baha'i activities, everybody comes because, and people will say, well, I'm a Baha'i, aren't I? Uh, you know, when, on occasion, when it comes into, into context. And I'm thinking about a pregnant woman of 20 years old, 19 actually, in South Dakota where people came and told her about the faith and, and she fell in love with the teachings and with Baha'u'llah and the next spring was pregnant and um, knew that we fasted through this month and fasted until just before her child was born someone came and visited and she said well when, sun, when sundown comes and no one had, had told her you know she knew so little but what she did know she followed and so she fasted through her pregnancy the baby was fine. <laughs> you know he was protected, right? But, but that steadfastness was such little information. 
And then, of course, visiting Eskasoni uh, out in the east end of Canada at a potluck and, and walking among, you know, how I used to sort of sit here and you sit there at one of these community potlucks. Every conversation that I overheard was about the writings of the Guardian uh, in some aspect. And, I, and these were Indian Baha'is. And I was just so thrilled and thinking, and this is such a healthy community. And of course, they were very, very welcoming. And I'll never forget when we, uh, there's, they have their own radio station. Uh, one family does, and they broadcast to the whole community. And it's almost entirely indigenous and Baha'i materials. And when we were driving, he said, well, let me turn the radio on now. And because there's something, there might be something interesting on. And of course, he knew what he was doing. And there was a welcoming song from the Lakota being played <laughs> as, as we drove up. And I am Lakota. And so that was uh, very meaningful to me, but just a, a symbol of, of their awareness of the world. And yet, um, their deep interest. And it wasn't conversations with me. It was overheard conversations about Shogi Effendi's writings. And then, of course, um, eating fish with the Indians among, on the Yukon River in Alaska, where uh, dear Fletcher Bennett drove, you know, flew us in, and, and we would land and meet with little communities. And I especially have memories of the first salmon at one time. And then also about people sitting and, and talking about there is one message for that year. And so, I mean, these are just, who can say that isn't a, an incredible privilege? And, and probably even more so is that, even though I come from a large extended family with many half-sisters and cousins and so forth, I really think my two sisters are, are women, uh, Alison Healy and Yvonne and Alice and Louise and Elizabeth and Patricia. I mean, you'll probably know the names that go with these, the last names that go with these, but this is really my, these are my, my uh, spiritual sisters and, and probably closer to me in many ways than uh, those members of my family who, who I certainly love, but, but it isn't the same kind of, uh, it's, it's similar but a different feeling. So that takes me back to how did I get from, or what, what was it that, that uh, I'm to do with this knowledge? having had this privilege of, of being able to visit these communities. And I think I have to go back and say a little bit about who I am. So my life was rescued before I was born. Uh, my, you know, I wasn't supposed to live and a medicine man, uh, Wichasa Wakan, performed a ceremony and he said there was a purpose to this life and it was to be rescued. And so that gave me, me a little bit of a, uh, not spoil, but gave me extra attention from my grandparents. Um, both of my parents are uh, enrolled members of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I am a left-hand bull and a Bordeaux and a standing bear and a lone dog. And uh, those are, are my closest grandparents. Um, right now I own land on the Rosebud and Pine Ridge and Wind River Reservations because uh, through inheritance. And so I, I consider that, you know, all, the, all three of those reservations to be mine now. But I grew up my early years in a two-room uh, cabin on the Little White River in South Dakota, and it's so beautiful there. But yeah, we went to town in a buckboard wagon, pulled by a team of horses. How many of you can say that? <laughs> and, uh, but it tells you how old I am too, I suppose. Uh, it's just fine. The, um, my best memories, of course, of my grandmother getting up before dawn and, and starting the, the bread that she put in the oven. Um, and my grandfather getting up and going outside and praying, facing the east and raising his hands, you know, and just singing. Uh, and the fact that, you know, there was no English spoken in that house. If people could understand it and occasion, you know, when visitors came, English was, you know, there was English dialogue. But what I noticed more than that was that my grandfather spoke with a sing-song lilt of the rosebud. You know, everything comes up at the end. It's very pretty at least to my ears, and my grandmother had a strong pointedness. And later on, I realized that it was the, uh, it was the difference between Sichangu and Oglala. And you know, there's just, that, that difference came more to me. So I think I'm actually pretty good at mimicking now and uh, have fun with that sometime. All languages, you know, I can sort of get that inflection because I heard so many different in my childhood. Um, I don't know if visitors who came to see us, because there were plenty of them, thought we were poor. I really uh, don't know if my family thought that we were poor. I don't think so. I mean, I think they were concerned, 
because we were often hungry. And I do, reflecting back, remember how it felt to go many days without you know, having much to eat. And also uh, singeing puppies, helping my grandmother taught me how to singe puppy uh, because we would sometimes have to eat, you know, we would eat the puppy and not just for ceremonies, but, but uh, or they were related to ceremonies, but we weren't in the ceremony. And then, uh, of course, the hunting and the game. And every year when my grandmother started the New Year's prayer, she would recall every single piece of um, meat, every animal that had given its life to us, and thank the Creator for that. And what a memory. And, I, and it just seems it's missing in my life that there should be a time when I think I stop and reflect on all the gifts of my life. I don't do that often. But um, I go back to, um, to those thoughts often and, and realize that my earliest understanding of being, mitakuyasi, um, we are all related. We are all part of each other. That was my mother's teaching to me. And I heard it from my grandparents. I heard it from my uncle. But that, I think, it, I think at a very young age to have that understanding, you know, to have that said so often at the end of prayers that it, it goes very deep, as we heard twice already this morning about that phrase. Um, but the other thing that she talked to me about was God. And in our language, it, it is commonly said, but it really means, it's, it's not a literal translation, and she would explain this to me more than one time, that it was too big to know. It's called the great mysterious. Not the great mystery, but the great mysterious. And she said, that is God, is the great mysterious. And so, you know, it's something you'll never fully understand, but it's something that you have to always be uh, aware of. And, and the only way that you can begin to understand, she would say, is when you look at things and you think about them. And she meant rivers and trees and the ceremonies and the pipe and that sort of thing, that all of those things she told us were there for us to understand the great mysterious, to understand our creator and the power that moves us and takes care of us and that disciplines us and so forth. And so this was my, my earliest, um, the ones that I can remember the earliest, other than that of being treasured. Uh, I remember walking you know, across in this little cabin in front of my grandfather and he would just say my name and I would turn to see what he wanted and I realized that he didn't want anything, he would just say it, that it was just a celebration of this grandchild. And there were a lot of grandchildren, so I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't like the only spoiled one or something like that, but, but you definitely got this sense of being cherished. And through that, and throughout my whole childhood, um, our whole family, our whole community was really centered on the child. It, it was very confusing to me when I moved to the cities and became engaged in things when people would say it's the elders, you know, we must feed the elders first and, and we must always respect the elders. Well, certainly the respect for the elders, but what I grew up with was child-centeredness. And so the first people to eat were always the children. And of course, you know, we were poor. I mean, not poor, poor, but we, we didn't have much food to eat. And so we were hungry and when we had food, the children were rounded up, you know, were called first and fed. And the old people will tell you that's the way it's supposed to be. And uh, it, is in, it is in my family, at least still to this day on my reservation, on the Rosebud Reservation, that is. Um, I, so I think what I wanted to say with all that is material existence is more than material wealth. And it's a sense of being a people with the, with the social constructs, the relationships, the things that, that make you related to one another, and also our ceremonies. You know, the, the, you know, the ceremonies were only symbols, remember, but they were the ways that we, we centered our whole community beyond our family around a spiritual context, a spiritual reality, rather than a political one in the sense of um, well, there was, there was the sense of, of territory to hunt and, and that sort of thing, I suppose. But my mother uh, really was one who could remember the stories of her grandmother because she was her, her, my grandmother, her grandmother's primary day-to-day care, uh, -day caretaker. And her grandmother would talk about the times, you know, that now's the time we should be going to the uh, the little bighorns to gather the timber. They didn't call them the little bighorns, but they should, oh, you know, we should be 
we, no, that's a different word, I didn't mean that, to um, the Bighorn Mountains to gather the timber for the teepee poles. And now is the time when the team sala is ready, the, you know, the roots, the tear uh, up. And now is the time when we should be doing this or that. And she would remember as her childhood, the, the seasons and where the tribe went for different things at different times. Well, my mother, uh, I just have to tell you, my grand, great grandfather had two wives and one of them uh, it was a sister, and then he, he, married, he married a woman, and he had to also marry the sister, or he, he chose to because that was the kind thing to do because she needed to be married and to have a husband. Well, it was the sister who was, um, she became blind, and so at four years old, she was put in my mother's care, and my mother's job was to guide her around. So she would ride on her shoulders and turn her head and tell her, you know, what was, what, if she had to step down or go a certain way. And then she also was in charge of making sure that if she spilt soup or that she got her food and that she got, you know, she helped clean up and, and helped her out in that way. So she spent a lot of time with her. And really, you know, I think the basis of this is that she also was very much aware of what held us together. I never once from my mother or my grandmother or in the stories heard about hatred or anger toward the non-Indians. And when I reflected back on that, even in high school, I was surprised. And when I was a younger woman, a young adult in my 20s and 30s, and there was all this, you know, the, the uh, uh, activist activity, everybody was angry and shouting and you know, condemning. And I kind of wanted to be strong like that, but I didn't, I didn't have anything to base it on. So when I heard that my grandfather had refused to work any longer in the mission schools because of the way the children were treated, I latched onto that because it was something of, of, a, of a, uh, anger, you know, that he, he came away. But what there was was a lot of pain. And I think that, that it, it continues today. I think it's actually the pain and not anything else that... Um, is in, that is still needing to be dealt with in some way. I think there's, there's a lot of pain. These days, it's often through drugs and alcohol. In the past, it was you know, from simply, I think the men didn't have anything left to do after the reservations were established. There was very little work for men in the traditional roles. The women fared better, and I think it's showing now, you know, over time that has shown up, and it's, it's gradually beginning to catch up. But I was really aware of it, even as a young woman. So, I, I have another grandfather I want to talk about. His name is Chief Luther Standing Bear. This is my, my father's grandfather, actually. So these are of the same, uh, uh, this generation of my mother's grandmother and my father's grandfather. And, my, and Chief Luther Standing Bear wrote a book called, he wrote several, but the important one was Land of the Spotted Eagle. And in this book, he tried to explain exactly what I'm trying to explain now, who we were and what were our values. It's, it's, uh, it's, he put a lot of effort into it, and actually this book is used in a lot of uh, college courses now as a, as, a, as a foundational understanding of at least the Northern Plains, or specifically the Sioux. But I feel sort of like I'm the bridge between that period, my grandparents' great, my grandparents' parents and grandparents, and the future. So I, I kind of feel like I'm, you know, I'm reaching out like this, just touching back to, to my grandmother and saying, what, you know, what do I remember? What did she say? What, what was real? You know, it, it, what, what did she give to us? What did she do? What was her life like? What am I to treasure and know and understand from that? And then thinking, okay, here I am standing in my mid-60s and reaching down to my niece. I don't have any grandchildren myself yet, but I have them through family way. Reaching to my nieces and their children and reaching and thinking, I, I need to stretch this way and then give it that way and stretch this way and give it that way. And, and, but be sure of where I stand, because where I stand is this woman who had this privilege of serving Baha'u'llah through visiting some of his loved ones. And so what did, I, mean, what did, I, what did I learn from that? Um, when my grandfather rode on a train going to Carlisle Indian School, he sang, he was six years old, and he sang a death song the whole way in order to, be, to keep himself brave to meet his death. And what it turned out, I think because he prayed so hard, he really turned out to be someone who helped the people in different ways, in 
not that it was asked for, but because he took, he had a lawsuit against the government to be able to live off the reservation wherever he wanted, he actually won citizenship <laughs> for uh, all the Indian people. And not that they wanted it at that time, but uh, since then I think it's become kind of helpful. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm mentioning this construct because, because um, these are the things I think that tell you what, if you look at what was behind those actions, and then we look now at, um, at, the, at what the Baha'i faith has given us. I'm the only one so far in my family, my, my close family, who is a Baha'i. But it doesn't matter because everybody else is working hard too for that future. And some, at some point they're going to come, come together. But you know, the Indians have been given so many special considerations. The first is in the Tablets of the Divine Plan in which Abdu'l Baha said you must attach great importance uh, to these Indians and ends that, that paragraph with should they become educated and properly guided, there can be no doubt that they will become so enlightened as to illumine the world. Well, um, and then in, in the Rizwan message for the four-year plan, the House of Justice sent a special paragraph just to, just to the indigenous people of North America. Who gets that? You know, so many efforts down through the time to, to help us out, to, to place us. But I really think that attaching great importance was equally important for the people who did that as it was for the people who received it. And that's because it, it made them, it forced them in a sense, not forced in a mean way, but forced them to expand their understanding that just because people were Indian and downtrodden didn't mean that they weren't loved of God and equal. And I think that's really the biggest lesson. It wasn't that Indian people had special characteristics that were going to do anything. It was like even, even these people, if they become enlightened, will become so, will illumine the world. Because really, what enlightens people, what causes illumination after all, is unity, right? And anybody can achieve that. And we're told in, in Baha'u'llah's writings that even a single soul can, can in, uh, 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 illumine a whole world. I think that's, is it a whole nation or a whole world? I, it's, I'm, it's falling away, because I know I'm out of time already. Um, but right now, you know, I think that, that one of the things that, that, that's tempting, what I've learned over this time is that when people, cultures, groups, families, individuals, it, I said that backwards, individuals, families, groups, you know, uh, the communities, when they circle around the writings of Baha'u'llah and don't focus on other things primarily, the strength comes among the Guaymi who, who learned first about the covenant. Um, when I look now at the Navajo, the community of the interest, what was, the, was different is that they, instead of having just cultural events, it's easy there because it's huge and large and there's culture all around, they focused on studying the writings of God, holding devotional gatherings and having children's classes and then focused on their youth. I can't tell you there are a dozen or more who are going to the best universities in the United States now and achieving good grades. And I can't say that there's there's not a connection. I believe there is. And so as the Universal House of Justice, I'm going to cut, cut a couple of my paragraphs off here, and maybe we can talk more later uh, in the questions. That the, when the Universal House of Justice this spring at Rizwan told us that uh, what, what lightened their hearts the most was not the numerical winning of these goals, but the, but the change in culture. Of course, I, you know, I, my thought went how, you know, how joyous news that was that we pleased them. And then I thought, culture, you know, this is really what it has to be. Because in the end, what the, the culture of the American Indian people is, is changing as much as anything else. And this final paragraph that means everything to me, it is who I am as a Lakota woman, who is who my great grandmother was, and who I pray my great grandchildren will be. This is the is this um, standard. The virtues and attributes pertaining unto God are all evident and manifest and have been mentioned and described in all the heavenly books. To me, that means the pipe as well. Among them are trustworthiness, truthfulness, purity of heart while communing with God, forbearance, resignation to whatever the Almighty hath decreed, contentment with the things his will hath provided, patience, nay, thankfulness in the midst of tribulation. 
that rang true to my understanding of who my grandmother was, my grandfather as well. Thankfulness in the midst of tribulation and complete reliance in all circumstances upon him. These rank according to the estimate of God among the highest and most laudable of all acts. All other acts are and will ever remain secondary and subordinate unto them. The spirit that animated the human heart is the knowledge of God, and its truest adorning is a recognition of the truth that he doeth whatsoever he willeth, and ordaineth that which he pleaseth. Its raiment is the fear of God, and its perfection steadfastness in his faith. Thus God instructeth whosoever seeketh him, he verily loveth the one that, heart, that turneth toward him. There is none other God but him, the forgiving, the most bountiful. All praise be to God, the Lord of all worlds. When I read that selection, my understanding inserts the name of God that the Lakota use or did use until well, until fairly recently, the great mysterious. And I think about the new culture and reconciliation in that way of how as we evolve our culture, we'll preserve it, but it also will be evolved. It will wrap itself into what God hath ordained. Pilamaya. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that very personal journey, which I think exemplifies and illustrates for us reconciliation in two ways. One, the reconciliation that is the expression of the spirit and our spiritual beliefs and understandings and how they take form in this contingent world through the stories of your parents and grandparents and, and family, as well as the reconciliation in the new culture that you speak about, of the coming together of peoples, of cultures themselves, reconciling themselves to a new reality that's emerging before us. So thank you for sh sharing that. Before I introduce the next speaker, I just want to acknowledge um, we have some distinguished uh, individuals and guests with us today. And, and one I wanted to acknowledge, I'm I'm not sh sure if he's here, but we have amongst us Chief Mike Leach, one of the chiefs of the Statlium Nation, and I want to acknowledge his presence here and welcome here very much. Our next speaker is Chief Douglas White. Uh, Chief White is the chief of the Sanaimo First Nation on Vancouver Island, one of the largest First Nations uh, in British Columbia. He's also one of the um, elected heads of the First Nations Summit, uh, which is the organization that represents all of the First Nations in British Columbia engaged in the treaty process. And in that capacity, he is also one of the um, members of the First Nations Leadership Council, essentially the political leaders of all First Nations in British Columbia in engaging in high-level issues with, with governments and the Crown. But in addition to that, Chief White is a remarkable individual, a lawyer, an artist, a sculptor, a scholar, a speaker, and he exemplifies a, and is the leading symbol of a new generation of Aboriginal leaders across Canada who are bringing the highest levels of insight, wisdom, knowledge, integrity, and skills of, in manifold ways to their work. And I can say from my personal work, which does um, involve Chief White in many ways, that I hear from all sides, whether it's other First Nations leaders, whether it's with government ministers, um, whoever it is, members of the communities on the ground, 
that they all speak of Chief White as exemplifying a new possibility, a new style of leadership, and uh, some new and creative thinking and visions for the future. So we are so grateful that he's joined us here this morning. Now welcome Chief White. Asiam Nesiaia, Aintha Pek Kolasalten, Tani Snanemoch, Aintha Pek Klishen, Tani Hopachasset, Aitna Squalowen, Kwanas Iach I, Haid Sepka, Siam Mastimoch, Haid Sepka. Good morning, my dear friends and relatives. My name is Kolasalten from the Snanemo First Nation. My name is also Kleeshan from the Hoopachusset First Nation. My English name is Douglas White III, and I'm the chief of the Stanamo First Nation, which is located just across the Salish Sea from where we are today on the eastern shore of Vancouver Island. The Stanamo people also in the summer came over to this side of the water to fish for salmon at our summer fishing village near Fort Langley. As Roshan mentioned, I'm also elected to the First Nation Summit Task Group Political Executive. I just want you to know how much I have a good feeling in my heart this morning to be asked to come here to share a few thoughts with you this morning on this important issue. I want to thank so much my uncle Titan, Shane Point, for his prayer this morning and for the words that you shared with everyone here. Um, I want everyone to know that everything that I am, whatever strength I have, whatever I know about love, whatever I know about being a good person comes from my uncle and comes from my family and my people. The prayer that he he put forward the chant asking for the ancestors to be with us, recognizing our relationship with the Creator, recognizing our relationship with the past, recognizing our duties to the future is something, it illuminates the way that we begin each day in our lives, our approach to every single day, that we begin in prayerful reverence to the Creator and creation. And I want to give recognition this morning, too, before I begin, to the fact that we are in the territory of our Musqueam relations. It means so much to be able to give that recognition and respect. As much as it means to me so much to be asked to come up here this morning to share a few words, um, the feeling that it gives me in my heart when I know the history that we've had in this country over the last 130, 40, 50 years, and when I know that the place that my people have had um, in relation to the crown, in relation to society in general, for the majority of that time, it really means a lot to be asked to share my voice and to share my thoughts and to put forward a small part of who I am for your consideration to engage with you in a real and a meaningful way. It means so much. And I offer up a similar recognition to the fact that we're in the territory of the Musqueam people, that they're in a sacred relationship with this place. This territory is tied up in who they are as a people that everyone shares here in Vancouver. And so, Coming to that reconciliation or that understanding of the importance of place, the importance of the people who are in that sacred relationship, of course, is one of the main focuses of the work that I've spent my life upon, that my father spent his life upon, that my grandfather has spent his life upon. It's the work, it has become the work of our people over many, many generations now 
to try to find ways to create meaningful and real relationships and reconciliation based and premised upon a foundation of love and respect. So I want to, um, I want to give thanks to the North American Executive Committee of the Association for Baha'i Studies and just say how much I'm humbled and honored to be here for that invitation. Because I really do believe that such invitations are the foundation for real reconciliation in the future. That it's the opportunity to sit down together and to talk and to share, to enter into meaningful dialogue and discourse, to get to know each other in deeper and real ways, to spend times like my uncle shared about his mother and the friend from Washington State, to take the time to sit down and talk, to share each other's views and beliefs and values, to get them in the mix of a real conversation and out of that build a foundation for a real relationship of respect and love, to build that one family. And I just really want to thank my uncle for sharing that. That's, it really meant a lot to me to hear about that conversation from the 1960s. Because I'm going to be, part of what I'm going to be talking about is about the, the progression of the relationship and time from my father's time to my grandfather's time. And I want to say that uh, it's really remarkable how much everyone that stood up here this morning so far has spoken about their grandparents. You know, as indigenous people, I think that, you know, we, we really are and we really do come from and we really do, our, our sense of identity and who we are as individuals is informed by our grandparents and our parents. And I'm going to be doing the same. I'm going to be sharing with you a couple of um, stories and experiences in my own life about my grandparents with the hope that those stories will share with you something about the unique worldview of the Coast Salish people, our own particular cosmology and understanding of creation, to put forward that different worldview to understand um, the complexities that are in the middle of the conversation of building real reconciliation that we need to come to a place to understand that the differences in worldviews are critical, that we need to spend the time to sit together and talk, to understand them, to articulate them, to appreciate them, and to give them recognition and respect if we're going to be able to build that reconciliation. So I'm very thankful, Uncle, for your opening words. It really helped me come up here and to be able to, to do what I'm doing today. And I wanted to give recognition also to your, your public and, and, and private club that you belong to. <laughs> I believe you said it was for old men, so I don't think I qualify yet. And, and it made me realize that, I went, gosh, I think I've got my own public private club. And it also only has two members, and the other member is Dr. Roshan Dhanesh. <laughs> and very much, very much like you, um, the only other member of our club is a doctor. And he also asked me to come here today, and so here I am. That's just remarkable. It's an... <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my grandparents and, and the worldview and cosmology that I've been passed down uh, from them to think about what is the relationship, what does it mean to be human as a Coast Salish person with our own unique viewpoint, and then talk a little bit about how, um, how that makes the work difficult or challenging in terms of reconciling 
and building real relationships between the Coast Salish people and the rest of Canada. I'm also going to try to say a little bit about how so much of my own work and, and so much of the work of many of our leaders is focused on the political and legal dimensions of reconciliation and how as important as those two dimensions are, that it's a mistake to focus only on those dimensions. And so I was so happy to see that this morning's panel um, asks us to engage and consider in the aspects of the spiritual reconciliation that's required, the social reconciliation that's required, and the cultural reconciliations that's, that's required to build um, an enduring and, and, uh, and meaningful uh, reconciliation for the future. So I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about what does it mean to be human in the Coast Salish world? This, the, the, what does it mean to be a beautiful human being in this world? What is the nature of humanity and what is the relationship of humanity to the rest of creation? Who are we as humans in relation to the creator and creation? And what is the essential nature of humanity? I think that there's no other place to start than with the foundational reality that for the Coast Salish people, the world is animated with energy, spirit, and soul. And when I say the world, I mean all of creation. And this includes what we generally refer to as inanimate objects, water, the earth, the air. All of these in our view are alive in the spiritual dimension of existence. They're ancient, they're alive, and we are in a meaningful and real relationship with them. And it's this reality that informs all of our interactions with creation. So to give a little bit more about this, I'm gonna share a story a little bit about, uh, about my grandparents. Um, I was raised in part by my father's parents, uh, my grandparents Kualasalwat and Te Kwap. Their English names are uh, Dr. Ellen White and the late Chief Doug White the first. My grandmother, Kualasalwat, had the, the good fortune of being from the United States side of the Coast Salish world. And yet she was raised in Canada on her family's island in the midst of the Gulf Islands, um, just to the east of where we are. Uh, because she was born in the United States, she wasn't considered a Canadian Indian under the Federal Indian Act in Canada. And therefore she, along with many of her cousins that lived there on, on Rice Island, which is now called Norway Island off the coast of Cooper Island, her and her cousins uh, weren't allowed to go to residential school, the big residential school that was there on Cooper Island. And she recalls uh, with really deep irony being a young girl hanging onto the windowsill at the residential school on Cooper Island and wishing with all of her heart that she could go to that school. Well, she could not and neither could her cousins, so their grandmother said to them all, if you can't go to their school, then you're gonna to go to my school. And this was a beautiful moment in our family's history since their grandmother was a traditional healer and had many different kinds of specialized knowledge to pass on to her grandchildren. And for me, this has meant that I grew up gathering medicinal plants in the mountains and fields with my grandmother and witnessed the intricacy and the nuance of her engagement with creation and the creator in this activity of gathering up the plants that she required to help people. And this, like every other activity, of course, in the Coast Salish lives, has a clear spiritual dimension. She prayed in the days leading up to the harvest, many days before getting ready, praying to the Creator about what she was going to be doing in the days ahead. She prayed early in the morning, the day that we were gonna go out when the sun was coming up. 
And as we approached um, the place where the plants were, she prayed yet again to the Creator, begging for permission and humbly asking for the Creator's grace and the opportunity to use the plants to help someone in her work, to heal someone. And at this time, uh, she also engaged directly with the plants and the earth supporting the plants and the overall space itself, talking to them all lovingly, acknowledging how precious each was and engaging with their energies, as she called it, addressing them formally and asking for their help, as well as the help of the Creator. So I just want, I want to say really plainly that the, this activity was not simply or merely an economic um, gathering activity. This wasn't just about resource extraction. What I was witnessing and what I was a part of uh, was a community of complex and deep interconnections between my grandmother and myself, between the Creator, between the plants, between the earth, between that place, all of us together formed a community of deep interconnections tied together by the Creator as a loving family. Where each is concerned about the well-being of the other and where each is willing to sacrifice in service to the other. And where each is compelled to hold the other up and to support each other by the loving relationship provided by the Creator. So that's the first story I wanted to share with you, was that simple experience of me growing up with my grandmother going to gather medicine for her to help heal people that it illuminated for me the, the nature of who we are as people in the world in relation to the Creator and creation. That we're in a very deep interconnected relationship with all of creation. That all of creation has energy and spirit and must be respected and addressed in that way. That if this wasn't done, that if we didn't behave in this way, if we didn't have this disposition to creation, that if we didn't understand the loving relationship that we were in with our territory, with our relations, the plants, those places in our world, if we simply went and took plants thinking that they would be able to help and heal us, without giving recognition and respect to that underlying and fundamental relationship that the Creator has put us in with them, that it would be damaging to the people that we were trying to help, that it would be damaging to us, that it would be damaging to those plants and to that place in the world that's so precious to us. So what does all of this say about human nature from the perspective of a Coast Salish person? I just wanted everyone to understand that from my perspective, that isolating uh, humanity from the rest of creation is no simple matter. I don't really know if it can be done properly in terms of Coast Salish worldview and the way that we approach and think of what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be in this world? And I just think that it's the will of the Creator that we live as we do as humans in a loving and interdependent relationship with our territories and all of the divine cosmos established by the Creator. That we're part of a holistic kind of relationship 
where we're engaged with creation in a loving way. I wanted to share too something about uh, my grandfather. That's the real kind of focus on some of the worldview and cosmology and, and our way of understanding and relating to creation. I want to as well talk about my grandfather a bit, Tequap, um, who raised me to be acutely aware of my obligations to myself and to my family and to my community. During endless evenings out on fishing with him out on the waters of Snanemoch. Uh, he would talk to me about what it means to be a Snanemoch person and how I should live my life in service to my family and my people. He told me what I should cherish, what I should protect, what I should value. He impressed upon me the importance of creating a real and meaningful reconciliation with Canada. He was the chief of the Snanemoch in the early 1960s. And at this time, um, a number of, a couple of members of our nation were charged under a provincial statute for hunting out of season for deer. July 7th, 1963, Clifford White and David Bob were up hunting in the mountains of Snanemoch, and they were charged by a conservation officer for doing so. They went into court and they did a really simple thing. They stood up in front of the magistrate and they said, we have a treaty right to do what we were doing. Stood up and talked about that history. What they got in return was a crown position that there is no such thing as a treaty between the Snanemoch people and the Crown. That's what they got from the prosecutor. What they got from the judge, from the magistrate, was a conviction and was a lecture on being piggish. The magistrate said to Clifford White, it's pure piggishness on your part to come into my courtroom and talk about treaties when you could have simply gotten a license from the the provincial government to go hunting. Well, my grandfather and the community members of the time, both of my grandfathers, people from Snanawas, Frank Calder from the Nishka, Guy Williams from the Native Indian Brotherhood, all of these people came together to hold up and support that basic act of standing up and saying and asserting that we are in a relationship with the crown from 1854. We came to a reconciliation that recognized that we are a legitimate people, that this is our territory, and that our way of life needs to be protected, that our Aboriginal title and resources need to be recognized, and that we have a right to fish and to hunt. And so they brought forward that uh, court action. It's known as White and Bob. Tom Berger, one of the great jurists in Canada, who was the appeal um, counsel for my nation, called it the first shot fired by the Aboriginal peoples of Canada in their campaign to reclaim Aboriginal and treaty rights. While this is in 1965, it was finally affirmed in the Supreme Court of Canada that yes, there is a treaty. There is a reconciliation between Canada and the Snanemoch. And that means that the province doesn't have anything to say about hunting for the Snanemoch people. 1965, that's 45 years ago now or longer. And yet here I am, instead of Chief Doug White the first, now we have Chief Doug White the third. I'm, just yesterday, I spent the day with the chief negotiators from across the province. Um, came together to meet in a forum where the subject of the discussion was how do we as the indigenous peoples of British Columbia find a way to have the crown leave behind their 19th century approach to engaging with us, one that's premised on the denial of our rights, one that's premised on 
the extinguishment of who we are as a people? How do we shift them from this? How do we get here in 2010 where we're still in a position where all of the apparatus of the crown wants to take this position from so long ago? How do we get them shifted over to a different way of engaging, talking with us, one based on recognition and respect? So clearly, you know, I wanted to talk about how important it is to have a comprehensive approach to building meaningful reconciliation. That yes, the courts are important, but the courts are not gonna provide the reconciliation that we should all be aimed at. Yes, politics are important, but treaties, even though they're recognized as sacred agreements by the courts themselves. One of the only kinds of agreements that exist in Canadian or English law that are recognized as being sacred. Treaties themselves are not sufficient to build the kind of relationship that I think, and I think everyone here would share that we want for the future for our children. That we really do have to get to the healing that my uncle spoke of. I've seen in my own community so much in my grandmother's work, uh, how important that is for us internally as indigenous peoples to hold ourselves up and to make sure that we're strong spiritually and culturally so that we can properly engage with the crown. That's an important element of work that we're always focused on trying to achieve. And then on the other hand, we've got this great gap of understanding with the crown and amongst ourselves about where we're trying to go in terms of building meaningful reconciliation. How do we go from a place where we have Coast Salish who hold on to and who hold up a conception of engagement with the creator and creation that's premised on being in a loving, real relationship with their territories? to one where, on the other hand, we have a crown who's focused utterly on resource extraction, revenue sharing, who's focused on the economic material aspects of the relationship. It's a difficult challenge. And I know how much in my, when I look at the example of my grandfather, my grandmother's life, and the work that they did, they did a lot of work in the politics and the legal, but they also did a lot of work in the social and the cultural. My grandmother spent a lot of time in schools throughout Nanaimo and elsewhere, including UBC, sharing with everyone, herself and her people, sharing knowledge and understanding about who we are as Nanaimoch and Coast Salish. And I want everyone to know I've I'm, I'm got a lot of hope. I've seen the results of that kind of work that her and others Chief Michael Leach and others have done like him. All of the Aboriginal leaders that have come before me have taken time to try and help make people understand. And in my own work as the Chief of Stanemo, I have seen young Canadians grow up to become businessmen, uh, to become important people in the community that have a different, a fundamentally different approach and attitude towards us. So I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity, the recognition to, to come up here and stand up here and to engage in a conversation with you. It really means a lot to me. I just want to reflect and echo so much of what my uncle said about the, the beauty of the Baha'i faith. I've learned so much from my wife, Anissa, um, about the Baha'i faith, and so much of it really resonates with me in a deep way. It, it makes me feel makes my spirit feel like there's a path for all of us on this beautiful planet to be that one family. Thank you, uh, Chief White. Um, 
I should confess that uh, last night at dinner I was sternly warned that the most offensive insult in Coast Salish culture is to try to get somebody to stop speaking. So I may be out of the club, I don't know. I, I guess I'll find out later. But uh, unlike the old cool guys club, the doctor is not in charge in my club. It's always the chief, let me tell you. Um, but seriously, thank you for providing a particular vision of oneness and the meaning of oneness from a particular uh, set of teachings and learnings and worldview. And that's an extremely valuable contribution as Baha'is reflect on their own understandings of that fundamental teaching of being conscious of the oneness of humanity and how that expresses itself in action. I was also reminded um, during your presentation of, of how Amatul Baha Ruhiya Khanum would describe her own um, as you know, she traveled to indigenous communities all over the world. And she described herself what she would say when she arrived in a community and was greeted uh, by the community and would meet with the leaders and the community members. And she would say, she said she would always do two things. The first thing she would do is apologize. She would say she was sorry for what her peoples, meaning the cultures from which she had come, the wrongs and suffering that they had perpetrated on those peoples. And then she would say, and she would thank them for the great learning, knowledge, culture, which they have produced over thousands of years that benefits all humanity. And as you spoke about the processes of reconciliation. I think that lesson and example from Amitul Baha speaks to a certain truth that we all need to study and reflect upon. Before I introduce uh, our last speaker, I just want to acknowledge another uh, individual in the audience with us today, Dr. Evelyn Voyager from King Kong Inlet, another very esteemed friend who is with us today. Okay. Our last speaker is Dr. Lee Brown. Um, Dr. Lee Brown is the director of the UBC Institute of Aboriginal Health, um, was the coordinator of the Indigenous Doctoral Program at UBC, uh, completed his own doctoral studies uh, in education at UBC, um, co-author of many works, including uh, The Sacred Tree, a renowned education curriculum. Um, he is a most accomplished, most renowned um, individual, scholar, healer, um, holder of teachings. And we were talking last night, I asked Dr. Brown how long he had been a Baha'i. Um, 35 years, and while I've only known him for a few years, I have to comment on what an audacious and creative teacher of the Baha'i faith he is. And I don't use that word audacious lightly. I recall he was invited to the University of Victoria to give a talk um, I can't remember the exact title, it was on indigenous teachings and prophecies. And as is always the case, the room was packed with hundreds of students and professors there because they know of the scholarship and learning and standing of Lee Brown. Well, unbeknownst to them, he unleashed an hour long discussion of the Kitabi Agdas, <laughs> of Baha'u'llah's prophecies, of their relationship to indigenous prophecies, and they had no clue what hit them. It was remarkable, it was audacious, and what it brings to the surface is the fundamental challenge we all have, speaking of reconciliation, of striving to see the faith through the frames of reference and modalities and learnings that Baha'u'llah encourages us to view it through, as opposed to 
viewing it through our preconceived notions and assumptions. And what Dr. Brown does in his work is he brings that striving to the surface consciously so we can all see it. And that is what we sometimes forget to do. We just assume our conception of the faith is the faith and we carry on on our day. We need to bring that striving, that daily striving to the surface. And that's what his scholarship and his learning exemplifies. Last but not least, the president of the Cool Old Guys Club, Dr. Lee Brown. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> that's a hard act to follow. I, I would like to begin today by acknowledging this morning the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam Nation, unceded traditional territory in which you are setting. And give thanks to our good relative and lodge keeper, Shane Point, for initiating the Many Journalists' Hands session this morning. And, um, slide two. And, you know, when I moved to the Musqueam Territory, I called the, the Musqueam Nation and I talked with Shane. I said, I've come here to do a PhD. Is it okay? I'm asking you for permission to be in your territory, which I think every person living in a tribal territory should do. And not only did they say it was okay, they said, we're going to help you. We're going to help you. You can be president of the old guys club. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge all the elders and the chiefs and the dignitaries that are here today. And um, thank, thank you for allowing me these, this opportunity to share these thoughts. I'd also like to thank Chief Douglas White for wonderful stories and Jacqueline Left Hand Bowl and, and Deloria Bighorn and Roshan for um, joining us with in the panel today. <clears throat> I'm not going to do too much of a personal introduction, but I do want to say that um, I always am amazed by when people introduce me because I'm a recovering alcoholic and former drug abuser that was born into an alcoholic home with an alcoholic father that was a practicing alcoholic and drug addict. And I'm not going to talk too much about this, but it affected me at an early age. And what happened was that I began to go into the downward spiral of alcoholism and malnutrition, and by age 11, I had lost the ability to walk. I was no longer going to school. I was 11, 12 years old. I weighed 35 or 40 pounds. If you know what that looks like, it doesn't look good. I was in extreme malnutrition. And when you're in extreme malnutrition, the first thing the body gives up is the capacity to have children. Doctors told me I would never have children. And, um, and I started to ask myself this question, you know, what would it take to be healthy? What would it take for my family to be healthy? What would it take for my nation to be healthy? What would it take for the world to return to health? And I entered a path of healing for myself, which was to become a singer in the native tradition. And I had the opportunity to begin the session last night by, by singing and, and I couldn't resist putting a picture of myself and my children in my PowerPoint, and I want to say that I believe that I sing my children into existence. I sing my children into existence. <clears throat> and I've been blessed with wonderful children. I hear people complaining about their children. I just can't comprehend it because my children are the blessing of my life. They are my greatest teachers. My daughter on, on your right here is, a, my daughter Julie is a medical doctor doing a surgical residency at the University of Saskatoon. My middle daughter is a nurse, and the daughter on your far left is a 16-year-old going concern that, um, that is wearing, you might know as a crown. She had just become the princess of the Kamloops powwow in this picture. Last year, I'll try to remember what Hooper said last night and talk to take, not take the applause too seriously. <laughs> the uh, couple of weeks ago, I was working on a grant for the, the Institute of Health that I work in, and I was in my office at 8 o'clock in the morning. I thought of a good sentence to start this talk with today, and so I decided, well, I better write that sentence down before I forget. And six hours later, I was still writing. And I have never read a paper before. I always speak from the heart, but I'm going to do some reading here today because I want to write down what, what came at that time. So I'd like to begin today with these questions. 
What would holistic reconciliation look like? What would it require? How can we walk through the four holistic doorways of the medicine wheel together in a way that will allow us to discover the one doorway of unity and well-being? What healing, what acknowledgement must occur for reconciliation to even begin? Reconciliation, I believe, can only grow in the garden of absolute equality between people that have gained a true respect for each other. This necessitates a shift in our consciousness, a rethinking of our being, perhaps the very nature of our being, and to gain a more accurate perception of the nature of native human being that, that, that Chief Doug White and Jacqueline would talk about, the, the way that we actually are. We cannot achieve reconciliation on false views, false views, pity, or stereotyping. Reconciliation based on an I'm sorry is a turnoff. Reconciliation based on the strength of people's coming together is a beginning. We can be, if we choose, those people's coming together through strength that have contributions to offer each other in a movement towards an ever-advancing civilization. People who are, who are, in fact, each other's completion in the sense of bringing diverse gifts developed by the four peoples together for the benefit and blessing of all. We are each other's completion after having been separated for a long time. We are relatives that have been separated. Together, we're going to share some of what must be acknowledged today in each of the four quadrants of the medicine wheel. The, the medicine wheel, holistic model of being, mind, heart, body, and spirit for holistic reconciliation to occur. You know, last night when I was listening to Hooper, I was waiting as I wait with every speaker I ever listened to, I wait to see if they mention emotion. So many speakers I've heard, especially at the university, talk about mind, body, and spirit, but they leave the heart out. And Hooper, you know, he got to the heart last night. Wow, <laughs> it's the highlight of my day. What must change? Reconciliation must start from the beginning of contact. And I want to say that I'm going to share some heavy information, but I don't mean to make anybody feel bad, but this is what we are reconciling. But I want to begin by saying that all that came here to this land were welcomed in the beginning and were offered a home from the first time of their step on this turtle island. All were offered food that gave them strength. All were offered medicines that gave them health. All were offered land to have a place of family. All were offered government in which they could have freedom through a more perfect union. More perfect than what? More perfect than the Constitution of the Iroquois Confederacy. I wondered about that in third grade. More perfect than what? And all were offered sports to be able to play and have fun. Shane says we should have fun. And all team sports come from North and Central America, including cricket, football, basketball. You may think James Naismith and other basketball, but Indians were playing basketball a long time ago. What do we need to look at? In the mental doorway, one of the things that needs to happen in order, for, I believe, in order for reconciliation to occur is that naive intelligence must be recognized. And this is not, this is very difficult because Canada and the United States are based on the theories of Descartes and John Locke. John Locke, who believed that native people were too emotional to be considered intelligent and therefore less than human. John Locke stated in his treatise on government in 1696, there was a duty of Christianity to suppress the emotions of American Indians so they could be, and this is a direct quote, almost as good as an Englishman. <laughs> How good would that be? Anyway, <laughs> these, <laughs> these, these theories were embodied in the residential schools here in Canada. On the first page of the document that created the modern day residential schools in Canada, in the third paragraph, a man, named, a man named Davin wrote, that the primary purpose of residential schools would be to suppress the emotions of native people. Colonization is about suppressing emotion. These theories were embodied in a theory of John Locke that promulgated the theory of terra nullis. John Locke wrote, the land is empty. There are no human beings here. He considered us not human. Locke's stories led to acts of extermination against native peoples. The first act of extermination, a written act of extermination, was against the Pequots. 
The last written act of extermination of native peoples was in the Constitution of the State of California. Locke's theories and the concept that of native people were not human led to the bounty system. In Eastern Canada and the United States, not long ago, the bounty on a native adult male was 100 pounds sterling and 50 pounds sterling on a woman or child. Not long ago, you could have received 150 pounds sterling for taking the lives of my children. Not long ago. And that's why the acknowledgement of of, um, <clears throat> of Navy intelligence is very difficult because it violates the foundational justification for the existence of Canada. And this is a difficult step to take. All of the Iroquois tribes, as far as I know, of the eastern United States, except for the Cherokees, were hunted to extinction. I can mention the names of some tribes. You've probably never heard of them. The only reason we were not hunted to extinction is because we were a great in number. In the physical doorway, the native body must be affirmed in all its strength and beauty, along with the physical and environmental achievements of native people. Native people today come in many different colors and hues. Some of us have blonde hair and blue eyes. Some have Africa, Af Afros and black skin. Some appear Asian. We have taken you all in. If you're from Iran or Uganda or, or France or China, your blood is in our veins. We are you. We are the evidence that our grandparents and great-grandparents believe that all human beings are human beings. Even when surrounded by those who thought they were less than human, they knew that all were worthy of love and marriage. And we married them. Today in our many colored youths, we are the physical manifestation of all my relations. We must be acutely aware that nativeness is not race, it's a way of being, it's a set of values embedded in a spiritually based culture, spiritually based cultures. To achieve reconciliation, we must rise to embrace a cultural view rather than a racial view. The problem is not that we are racist, but that we are racial in our thinking. Race is a box, it's a limitation upon being. Culture is a horizon, a potential. If we can become cultural in our view, we. We each can achieve Dr. Martin Luther King's admonition to view each other in the content of our character. I got to know a guy at a counseling conference in 1981. On the third day of the conference, he said, what are you, by the way? I said, I'm an American Indian. Oh, he said, I thought you were so intelligent. <clears throat> I said, well, I'm just as intelligent as I was five minutes ago. He said, yeah, but... And then he stopped himself, no, no, I didn't mean that. I said, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> we hear it in every class, in every school, in every day, at every place that we go. We must be aware that North America, when Columbus landed, was a cultured garden, full of food and absent of sickness. From the cultured forests and gardens of beans, corn, squash, squash, potatoes, and more of the East Coast, to the cultured Great Plains created by the Northern and Southern Plains tribes, created by the Northern and Southern Plains tribes to develop a buffalo herd of 60 million buffalo, to the advanced artistic and structured and knowledgeable societies of the West Coast, North America was a physical domain developed and created by native people with sustainability. It was not the Wild West. It was not terra nullis. The land was not empty. Among the largest buildings in the world when Columbus landed here were the architectural achievements of the Pueblos. Among the largest pyramids in the world were the pyramids of Mexico, oriented to the same stars as the pyramids in Egypt through, the, through an advanced mathematical system. Amongst the largest cities that went on earth when Columbus landed was Mexico City, then called Teotihuacan. And for that matter, so was Vancouver. That's one of the first North American malls long before Columbus, Indian kids were saying, let's go to the mall. <laughs> there it is. Two very important aspects of native, native physicality that briefly mentioned to above, that, but are very important, were the absence of illness in North America. That's why illnesses hit us so hard. This is an amazing thing. We had a medical system that had eliminated illness, and that medical system still exists, and it is re-strengthening, 
And I think one day it would be re-strengthening for the blessing and benefit of all human beings because I believe we will bring health to humanity. And the development of eight out of 10 foods that are eaten today, including the Irish potato and the Italian tomato, both of which come from here. Was in the faculty lounge the other day with a professor who was really enjoying his pepper and I said, well, you can thank Native people for that. He said, what do you mean? I said, pepper comes from North America. He said, I'm sure we had pepper in Europe. I said, no, you had spices and you got those from Asia. There were no, there were no peppers in Europe, no tomatoes, no potatoes, no corn, no beans, no squash, no pumpkins, until Europeans came here. We developed food for the world. The acceptance of these two developments is foundational to the acceptance of native science. Our science was our food and our medicine. The benefits of which have improved each of our lives right now today. These achievements must be acknowledged as some of the aboriginal contributions to the foundation of a world civilization for true reconciliation to re occur. If you enjoy the diverse cuisine available to you here in Vancouver, not only do you have the, the Iroquois, my people's beans and pumpkins and squash, you have the incredible food of, of this environment, the, the Northwest uh, seafood, salmon that I enjoyed last night. If you like that, if you appreciate the governments that we have, <clears throat> if you have a favorite sport team, well, you can thank Native people for that. So all these things come from our culture. I know these great achievements might seem almost unbelievable after 500 years of denial and pedagogical knowledge nullification. Knowledge nullification. And I'm aware and even more aware of the weakened state of the indigenous people in North and South America. But in my darkest moments, I, I take hope from the words of the peacemaker who predicted this time when, a time when all would seem lost, the time in which our grandparents lived. But he also predicted a time when native nations would become stronger than before. There are 3,000 Native communities in North America, and each of them right now are working to become stronger than before. In the spiritual doorway, the quantum physics of Aboriginal spirituality and understanding must be acknowledged, and hopefully one day comprehended by all. The prophets of this land must be acknowledged as true ones from God, including the peacemaker who founded the Iroquois Confederacy and civilization. I've long pondered myself, and that's what I talked about that night in the University of Victoria, the relationship between the law of peace of the Iroquois Confederacy and the most great peace of Baha'u'llah, between the long house and the universal house. In these relationships are the evidence of the true prophethood and civilization of North America. And most importantly, the emotional doorway, we must acknowledge, contrary to the teachings of Descartes and Locke, that native emotions are okay. It's okay to feel. I had a teacher in a teacher training one time asked me, you know, I had a 14-year-old native man who threw a chair and ran out of the classroom, he got angry, what should I do? I said, after 400 years of residential school, I should stand up and applaud that any native child has any emotion in this land. Paraphrasing the words of two of my great teachers, Dr. Daniel Jordan and Dr. Don Streets, founders of the Nisa Mall of Education, emotion structures values, the values mentioned by Chief Doug White. Therefore, not only are Native emotions okay, they are the foundation of Native values, the values of relationship, respect, harmony, balance, generosity, cooperation, non-interference, the value of learning through ob observation. I didn't know how cultural I was until I tried to take a dance class last year. I went to the class, the teacher said, get a partner, but I wanted to learn through observation. After five minutes, she said, how come you don't have a partner? Well, I didn't have, know how to explain my entire value base to her, so pretty soon I just walked out. And that's what happens to a lot of Native people. They walk out when the values are not understood, and they are not understood. These Aboriginal values developed by countless generations, contain the appropriate use of energy that will enable us as human beings to survive on Mother Earth. To achieve reconciliation, we must not only acknowledge the Aboriginal values of this land, we must find a way to integrate these values of all those who have come here. 
using that Dr. King again, Dr. Martin Luther King once said, it's one thing to integrate, a, it's one thing to desegregate a school, it's a completely different thing to integrate it. A, a community would be truly integrated and a society would be integrated if everyone's values were it present in the society, that would be truly uni unity and diversity. Since our value contain our emotions, our emotions contain our energies of life, it's necessary if everyone is to have the fullness of their potential, that they be allowed the full expression of their values. And in the current Canadian context, this is simply not happening. Aboriginal values are not in the schools, not in the courts, not understood by teachers, not understood by social workers, not understood by the RCMP. Our values are not in a single Canadian institution. We're trying to be a multicultural society with a monocultural value system. <clears throat> this is a recipe for failure. When will our children be allowed to be themselves in their own land? You know, one time I was doing a training for the RCMP and thought I'm going to be myself. And where I'm from, a good handshake is really gentle. You hardly touch the other person's hand. That shows that you're a knowledgeable and respectful person. Of course, in the dominant Canadian society, a good handshake is firm, shows you're honest. My culture, that's an extreme insult. So I'm going to shake hands with these RCMP officers like I, like I want to. The third guy just about broke my hand. I heard my hand crack. He said, man, what's wrong with you? Are you a wimp or something? This guy's a police officer in our community and don't know how to shake hands. And this is the challenge for us as Canadians, the great challenge. And as the Baha'is, how do we integrate values? How do we shake hands? Neither handshake is wrong, neither is right. But what do we do? Go to slide 18, I'm skipping a paragraph. <clears throat> Indeed, the single most greatest challenge we face, according to Sperry in his, in his book, The Science of Moral Priority, is to achieve the integration of diverse values into a unified system that can contain unity and harmony. Sperry argues that values are the number one problem facing the world. At the center of the medicine wheel, volition. <clears throat> in May of night, in May, in, in May of 2009, I had the opportunity to be one of the keynote speakers for the first annual World Indigenous Gathering in Lillooet, sponsored by Chief Daryl Bob and Chief Michael Leach. At the beginning of this gathering, I noticed flying in the wind on the, uh, on the uh, podium, the four flags for the four peoples, the, the red, yellow, black, and white flags that represent the prayers for the four peoples. And I thought to myself, we have held on to these flags. After all that we have been through, we have not lost. And you go to any native gathering across North America this summer, and you will find prayers for you have been made, whoever you are and wherever in the world you're from. We've held on to the prayers. We've held on to the pipe. We held on to the drum, and we held on to the lodge, the lodge of purification. We held on to teachings given at the beginning of the world. And most importantly, we held on to the knowledge of relationship. The knowledge that we are all related and there's no place where one person's family tree ends and another begins. Of all the nations and peoples of the earth, we have held on to a 500 year storm. Our grandparents and great grandparents held on, even when surrounded by the forces of extinction and termination. Through 400 years of residential school, through the attempts to invalidate our history and our languages and our very presence on the land, they held on, they endured. They held on to these teachings so that the reconciliation through re relationship and the possibilities of unity contained in the four flags and the four, day, four doorways would be available for our benefit and blessing for all, that is, for all who have come to this land at, in this day at this time. We are the living embodiment of our ancestors' hopes and dreams that their teachings would live to see the, this day of reconciliation. And <clears throat> These values and emotions are even more important when you consider what Hooper Dunbar mentioned last night about the Bob and the age of the heart. The Bob stated that the most essential quality for spiritual development of human beings is the purification of their heart. If this is true, how blessed we are to have communities of heart in this land that have not only survived, which is a miracle of God itself, but who have survived with heart, who have never let go of the teachings of the heart, who have held on to emotion and feeling, who see the world through the eye of the heart, who speak from the heart, who give with the heart, 
and who live the teachings of the heart every day. What precious gems these communities are for the entire world. Baha'u'llah said, my first counsel is this, possess a pure, kindly, and radiant heart. How blessed we are to have these precious communities still unnoticed, unrecognized by those who are seeking silver and gold, <laughs> land and minerals, power and wealth, but who fail to perceive this continent's greatest resource, its people of heart. And if you wish to embrace this reconciliation, if we wish to embrace this reconciliation, we must open our hearts, purify our hearts, heal our wounds, and proceed in kindness. For both the colonized and the colonizer, a letting go of the hurt and guilt is necessary to embrace reconciliation. And there is an intrinsic, inescapable relationship between reconciliation, justice, potential, and heart. Dr. Jordan and Dr. Street said in a society is just as if every person in that society has the same opportunity to ach achieve their full potential. And to me, this is the ultimate ideal of reconciliation. The ultimate ideal of reconciliation is to allow everyone to achieve their potential. Reconciliation is a stepping stone towards justice, and justice is a catapult towards potential. My children are not allowed the fullness of their potential in a country that still has an Indian Apartheid Act. And I know that most Native folks would defend the Indian Act today, and I, I would too. Because when you're down to not much, anything you have, you try to hold on to. But I predict that the Indian Act will one day shatter like the shell around a little bir bird coming to birth when we are ready to one day again take flight towards our potential. And, and, that day in the and in that day, the words of the peacemaker, stronger than before, will echo from every mountain and prairie. And I believe that Aboriginal potential will be actualized that will be greater than our greatest possible to envision it at this moment. Go to 24. <clears throat> I'm going to skip a little paragraph. In summary, the age of <clears throat> um, reconciliation begins and ends with the heart. It's 25. My friends, perhaps, perhaps this is that day foretold long ago by the glorious and wise ones of this turtle island, North America. The day which is the day of renewal, the day of rebirth, the day foreseen by Black Elk. The day in which we realize that the only path out of the desolation and despair of colonization is a path of justice that leads towards the horizon of potential for all the children of all the peoples of the earth who will be born into this coming age of heart. What a wonderful thing to be alive now, to see the, the springtime and the blossoming of Black Elk's vision and the blossoming of humanity. The day in which we realize that true reconciliation is a holistic process that activates our minds at the highest level of truth, our hearts at their most pure ability to love and behold, our spirits at their highest level of unity and cooperation, and our bodies in the use of their most respectful and sacred energies. So in closing, I want to ask this question again. What will it take for us to achieve true holistic reconciliation? To realize that all human beings are human beings, that all are worthy of love and respect and all contain wisdom. To realize that true reconciliation, to achieve true reconciliation, we must become as relatives to each other and to realize that the true potential of our children and grandchildren can only be actualized through the advent of divine justice and reconciliation. All my relations. So the prayer that uh, that was that really summarizes what is being shared this morning is a prayer of Abdu Bahas. O thou almighty Lord, strengthen all mankind that they may do according to the instructions and teachings recorded in these writings, so that wars and strifes may be eliminated from the world of man that the roots of enmity may be destroyed and the foundations of love and affection be established. 
that the hearts may be filled with love and the souls be attracted, that wisdom may advance and the faces become brightened and illumined, that there be no more wars and strife, and that the reconciliation and peace appear, that the unity of the world of man may pitch its tent on the apex of the horizon, so that the peoples and parties become as one nation, that different continents become as one continent, and the whole earth as one land, that the sects of antagonizing and dogmatic religions be unified, that the world of creation be adorned and the people of the earth abide in unity and peace. These were the instructions of our beloved master. Last night I was thinking this learning, this reconciliation, this healing, this is, we achieve part of this through, the, through this vehicle. We can't know everything about each other, right? We can't. We have to use this and this. Last night, our brother Lee opened the, the devotions and he sang what's called an honor song. Where I come from, when you hear that honor song, everyone rises. Because it's a sign of respect, it's honoring the creator. There was a number of us that stood. I did become aware that most people did not stand. And I thought about that and I thought, well, of course, most of you don't know that that is what is respectful. But you know, if you see a group of native people standing during an honor song, what might you do? It's, it's not hard. And if you stood, would that be a mistake? Would that contribute something of our, of our faith? It's a matter of learning. It's like the, the Hulkamina woman who was standing at the graduation and she was beginning to talk about uh, the prayer that she was gonna say and she was thanking the people as Shane did to be invited and she went. And the whole place stood up. But you understand going like this means I raise my hands to you, I'm thanking you. It doesn't mean you all stand up. <laughs> so. This is how we do this, it's through observation. We can go in any community and learn so much, but we learn it not through this. This is not really that helpful when you're going to, to learn. It's this and this. So I honor and thank you, and I, and I ask Roshan to carry on, and we'll, we'll finish up this morning, and I hope, I hope you're deriving what our purpose was. I hope you're feeling uplifted and, and hopeful for our future. Roshan. We're going uh, to move in to a few minutes of, is this on? I want to, is it on now? Are you using yes. this one? Now? Yes. <laughs> want to um, move into a few minutes of, of dialogue and, and discussion, but before that I want to thank uh, again Dr. Brown for really providing for us a very comprehensive perspective on the nature of reconciliation and what it means both in terms of our inner selves and then connecting it to the outer realities of the history of peoples and cultures interacting. And that alone is a reflection of the fundamental integration that is the challenge of each of our lives and communities individually. And I, of course, thank all of our panelists for their, their contributions this morning. I wanted to, a number of questions have come forward. I wanted to begin um, with where I think um, uh, Jacqueline uh, l left off. And, and the question that's come forward um, as you began to speak about the Reswan message and some of the statements of the House of Justice, is there is a fact of history, I'll speak in Canadian context for a minute, that religious communities do not have clean hands. 
to put it bluntly, in terms of relations with Aboriginal peoples and communities. Lee met, Dr. Brown mentioned the residential schools here in Canada, where various church groups played a role in horrendous abuses and circumstances that only now are we beginning to become fully aware of as a society collectively and begin to address. And so the question um, posed, which came to, uh, forward at the end of your presentation, but I open it up to all panelists, is, is what role do you see and how do you see the Baha'i community playing an effective, constructive, positive role in advancing these processes of reconciliation? And maybe I'll pose the question first to Jacqueline and then open it up to the other two panelists. The Baha'i community itself, I think, is um, not expert and never, I, I don't think should pretend to be expert. I think that the teachings, of course, are perfect. And as we are learning to understand application of those teachings, then we set a model and that we influence the communities around us. And so I think that it's actually very similar to, in a sense, when I was listening to Lee speaking, I was thinking that the, the absence of justice is the pain, is the, is mostly what he was, you know, in, in one sense, it was the absence of justice. And so as we begin to understand what true justice is, and that can only come from understanding um, and exhibiting our application of, you know, what Mr. Dunbar was saying last night, turning toward God rather than dwelling in the darkness. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it well, but I think that we have two parts. One is to model it, and the other is to engage in public discourse to share what we do, what, that the fact that we're learning, not that we know it yet, but that we know what's right because it's in the writings. We know that if all people are equal, then obviously justice would follow. I mean, in this one case, I think that... Um, the other piece of that is where there are many Indian Baha'is, or where there are many Baha'is together, that they already influence the very atmosphere, they influence the very society, they have this spiritual impact. And I think both things, I mean, I, it's all part of one, it's not two things. So um, I don't think it's a simple, it is a very simple straight path, but how we do it on a day-to-day -day basis is not uh, really, I don't think anybody knows precisely how we do it. We we learn as we go, and that's what we're doing right now. That's my perspective. And as I said at the beginning, I don't know anything. I'm just trying to figure it out myself. Thank you for the, for the question, Roshan. I think that I would just simply comment on, and, and say a couple of things. One, um, opportunities such as this in terms of the, the Baha'i faith, inviting other perspectives to come and, and sit down and talk is a really important activity to give that recognition and respect to other voices, other worldviews, um, people of other faiths is such an essential and important task to building uh, that one family in the future. And I've been, it, it's just been a beautiful part of my life in the last number of years to have had uh, Anissa as my wife who's Baha'i and to get to learn and to know about the Baha'i community, which is truly an astonishing one. In so many ways, uh, my life history is the opposite of Anissa's, where I come from a deeply, uh, a, a, a deep rootedness in place, where I grew up on a reserve in a place where um, my people have lived for thousands of years. And so we have a very uh, deep sense of community there. It's always a, you know, it's like everyone knows that we're related to each other and go, you know, 100 miles down the island and we're still related to everybody. So we're really um, 
located in a, in a certain way. And Anissa came, we met in law school, she came and uh, was an exchange student from an Australian law school, and I, I came to learn about her, the, the nature of her life, and I found it very uprooted from her Persian family and the experiences that she's had there as coming from uh, the Persian Baha'i community of um, diaspora. Likewise, from her Korean Métis side, and I found it to be utterly different from my experience, being displaced in the world from Iran to um, other parts of the, the Middle East, to Africa, to Canada, to the Solomon Islands, to Australia. But I want you to know one of the things that I've just been utterly moved by is even with all of that historical diaspora and that experience of being displaced, that the Baha'i community has an astonishing um, sense of community throughout the world. It's really meant something to me to get to learn that. And that experience, that, um, that actual living life as one family, that when Anise and I travel around the world, that we know people with real connections to each other, whether we're in Vancouver or back east or in Australia or up north, Anissa has connections, real meaningful connections to other people in those places through the Baha'i community, and that is something else. And I just wanted to also just say, you know, how amazing it was to be at the Nauru celebrations in Nanaimo earlier this year when Anissa and I arrived and we were asked to participate by Tamara Martella and others in that event, and how just beautiful it was to walk into a room and to be recognized and respected in that way, honored in that way to participate. So even though you know, the history that you refer to, Roshan, in Canada, of faiths and the indigenous peoples of this world has not always been a good one. In my own experience growing up by my grandmother, uh, Ellen White, Kualasal White, she's always taken the view that all of the different faiths in the world are aimed at the same thing. They're all trying to find the proper relationship with the Creator, with God, and so she embraces Catholicism. She sings in the choir. She embraces the United Church. She embraces the Baha'i faith. She embraces all of them. And um, that's something that's really resonated between me and my lived experience and, and the Baha'i faith. So I just wanted to add that just to, to that question. Thank you. What a sad thing it would be. <clears throat> I've often thought that the Baha'i faith like the other religions that come to this land, became another oppressor of native people, another hurt of, another place of hurt for native people, and I, I think that there, there's a danger of that. I think it could be, and I think you know some hurt has already occurred. But <clears throat> I really liked what Hooper said last night that we have to focus on uh, our own personal radiance. And we have to realize what the peacemaker said when he brought the, the government to the Iroquois people. He said that, that we only have one power to transform people, and that's teachings. And as Chief Doug White says, <clears throat> the Baha'is have been given up incredibly powerful teachings. But, but we have to acknowledge these, these things that I was mentioning in my talk for the hurt not to occur with the Baha'is as well. And to realize that there are communities of very advanced, knowledgeable people, very deep and spiritual people that, that are here in this land, and that the reaction with them must be respectful. And, and it, it is a struggle because, as Deloria said, when you go into a community, just like myself, when I go into a different tribal community, if I don't know their customs, I uh, have to learn them, and I have to apologize for my ignorance. And um, so I quickly found out when I moved to them this territory here, that some of the customs here are, are a little bit different than what I learned earlier in life. And, um, and so we're all in the same boat. But the important thing is to, is to be respectful and to look at the teachings and to work on our own personal 
healing and develop our own personal radiance. Uh, thank you for those uh, answers. I should note, uh, Chief White, you may have identified the foundation of reconciliation between Iranians and indigenous peoples, because <laughs> just as all indigenous peoples are related, so are all Iranians, or all <laughs> cousins, or fifth cousins, or... So, uh, so we've taken a major step forward here today. Um, the, the second question that's come forward, I think, Lee, you, Dr. Brown, you already started um, uh, pick, uh, answering it. Uh, um, but the question that was asked was, we, uh, we just asked a question about uh, the community. Um, the question that was asked is, uh, an individual has asked, what should an individual do to be an agent of reconciliation? So, any volunteers to start on that challenging question? You go ahead. I think it goes back to what Shane said when he spoke this morning is, we need to become friends. We need to get to know each other. And, and we don't know each other, really. And, um, you know, Dr. Jordan said that for us to truly know each other is for us to truly understand our values. And um, <clears throat> we don't know each other's values. And, and um, you can read that on Shane's behalf. And so I think that we, we need to take the time to really become friends and, and get to know each other. And um, to be in each other's homes. You know, in Vernon, British Columbia, where my children live, they each have two birthday parties because there's a number of children that they go to school with in town that would never come to our house under any circumstances whatsoever. Their parents would never let them visit us. So my children have a birthday party in town, they have a birthday party on the reserve. You know, and, and um, we need to go into each other's homes. We need to get to know each other. You know, I just wanna add, during the civil rights movement in the United States in the, um, well, especially in the 60s when it got really hot and blood was running in the streets, uh, there were people who, when buildings were being burned in Detroit, uh, some of the, the um, stores were left untouched. And then later, uh, when we, we uh, I was on a national board of, of the largest and oldest women's organization, and the world actually, but in the United States too. And we're, the whole purpose of ours, our organization is social justice. And one of the things we did was survey uh, uh, people in the country who had engaged in civil rights then and subsequently in almost 95% of the cases it was precisely what Lee just said is because they knew somebody personally. And they had, you know, whether they, they made a mistake in, a, you know, in, in social mores or whatever along the way was irrelevant. What really mattered was that they had actually known someone. And so to know is to love. And I think then, you know, when we individually uh, think about what our job is, you know, uh, as a society, as a, as a group of people that, you know, ye are the stars in the heaven of understanding but that comes down to the individual as well. And so we won't have any power unless our own inner, you know, our own inner conditions, our own, our own behavior and character matches that, uh, then any effort will be powerless. And so really, I guess it's starting, starting there and then moving outward. But I, you know, I couldn't agree more that knowing people is, is essential. Even if, you know, even if you know a little bit about the faith, even if you know a little bit about them, you'll have an impact. I would add as well, uh, simply the fact that um, make sure as an individual, as a parent, that you raise up your children in the best and strongest possible way. I was going to share with you, there was not enough time, but I wanted to share uh, one of the stories that my grandmother tells, one of our traditional stories, and it illuminates the importance of raising strong children, making sure that we make every effort to raise up beautiful human beings. That's a real important task in our lives, in each individual lives, as, as you all know. And I, I think that's one of the most profound opportunities that we have 
as individuals in the world is to make sure that our children grow up knowing who they are, having a strong value system, and, uh, and being good human beings. Um, I would just simply add that. We had, um, thank you, we had an answer also come from the floor to this question. Shane Point brought it up. He writes, teachings without application are in fact empty knowledge. Action is the essence of reconciliation. So we've, we've heard about purity of heart, sincerity of motive, um, acquisition of knowledge of one another, and then translating it into action as the, the elements of the individual agency for reconciliation. Um, I'm, just one more question. I know it's been a very full morning. But one more question um, that has been raised and come up, and it was touched on in, in Dr. Brown's presentation, and then in all three presentations, we heard stories of, of history, of personal histories, personal journeys. Um, but the question that has come forward is um, the role of history in achieving and advancing reconciliation. And part of the underpinning of the question that I see is it is not uncommon to hear stated, which is quite contrary to the presentations this morning, that reconciliation means just putting the past behind us. Things happened. Okay, let's just get on with doing something new. This is a very common response in the public imagination. It's a very common uh, way of talking that we hear, I think, quite frequently. And so the question is, is, goes to what is the role of acknowledging, understanding, becoming aware of that history in achieving reconciliation? And then going back to uh, the comments we opened with this morning, the relationship between history and healing and reconciliation. So. Any takers, volunteers? Jacqueline? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, you know, I think, I think, I, I think I don't know. I'll, I'll, you know, I've said that a few times, right? <laughs> but my thought is that it, history is, is really important in that it tells you where we were. And, you know, I personally love history. It was my, you know, when I went to college, it was my minor, and I probably since then has become my major. I love any historical book, and, and uh, especially about, well, it, it provides a context. But we don't, that history itself is so incomplete because it's only what people take, you know, when it's beyond just a few very short years. And I was thinking about the massacre at Wounded Knee and how important is it to know that? Well, it probably is important because it tells us something about what caused, you know, where the pain was and, and, the, and the injustice. But what I didn't know in most of my life, uh, even though I'm from that area, was that at the same time that the massacre at Wounded Knee happened, there were many, many letters, people, pioneers, settlers in the territory who wrote to the president of the government saying that it was an atrocity and it was shameful that it had happened and that they had lived side by side by these people who had been killed and even though the people had been hungry they had not stolen from them and and history common history doesn't tell us that part and so i'm i'm also leery when i read history that that we don't know everything or we don't know it all and um but still i think i think context is helpful I think that um, but it isn't everything. I think that we have to get past the you know past the dwelling on what didn't happen or that what what happened that was unjust uh, at some point and say and really focus all that energy into turning toward the light and so you know what what else is is noble in in the history may be a piece of that, but I'm not sure. Um, so that's just, this is my first thoughts. We, <clears throat> we began this morning uh, with a, a chant from my uncle. 
that uh, invoked and asked for our ancestors to be with us today, this morning. And it's their voice, their experience, that has been left out of the official histories of Canada for so long. And in terms of coming to a, a just and strong reconciliation today between Indigenous peoples and Canada, uh, giving voice to those ancestors is an absolute essential component. Um, we cannot move forward without giving recognition to the sacrifices that they've made, to the work that they did, um, to their sufferings and to their, their beauty. Um, one of the stories I told in my presentation had to do with the, the great um, power that the state takes for itself in terms of telling official histories, the profoundly powerful apparatus that it has to enforce that view of history that denies the voice, and that denies the contribution of my people and those ancestors that are here with us today in terms of authorship of that history, authority over that history. When the, the, the judge in the courtroom, the magistrate and the prosecutor could stand there and refute that there ever was a reconciliation between the Snanemoch and the Crown um, illuminates very clearly the, the importance of history in, in settling the matters between us and building strong relationships. And so I think I've always thought that history is an absolutely critical component of what we're doing, that our focus on the past and where we've been is essential giving recognition and respect to where we come from um, has to be at the foundation of, of where we're going. You know, one day I was working in my uh, art studio and my daughter Julie came home from school when she was in third grade. She said, Dad, guess what? I said, what, my girl? She said, you're wrong. <laughs> I said, what do you mean I'm wrong? She said, you said we were placed in this land by the great spirit creator of all good things at the beginning of this time. I said, yes, no. I learned a day in school that we walked over here from Asia only 2,000 years ago. I said, my girl, that's, that's just what the teacher says. Uh, we believe that, no dad, the teacher said. And that's what they teach in the province of British Columbia. They don't. Ten years later, I found myself at a meeting of Native parents with the principal of the high school in Vernon. He asked each Native parent what they'd like to see in the school, and I said, you know, I'm not from here, I'm from somewhere else, but my children are members of the Okanagan Band, and I was, would really like to see the Okanagan version of how Okanagan people came about taught in the school. This is the Okanagan territory. And the principal looked at me and said, Dr. Brown, I don't think we're ready for that. I said, well, how can I help you get ready? What do you need? It's about whose story gets to be told and whose story is believed. When I was at the Michael Leach's house, Chief Michael Leach, uh, this, a couple months ago and at, at the annual gathering this year, and there was a visiting shaman from Mongolia and when they introduced him as being a, a tribal person from Mongolia, I said, hey, you're from here. Because I had already been told he was an anthropologist, a Mongolian anthropologist. I thought, this has got to be cool. I said, what? he says, what do you mean? I said, well, a long time ago, the Bering Strait was frozen over and we walked over there. Oh, no, no, he said. Some of our people walked over here. I said, well, how do you know? Was there a sign? Like, was it a one-way street or what? I mean, why would anthropologists assume people only walked one way? I believe, I, <laughs> I believe people did walk over here from Siberia, and, and when they did, there were native people here to meet them. You know, and I believe that we went that way, and some of our people are over there today. And um, I, think, I think when the genetics, as it develops, a lot of people are going to be surprised. And, who's from where and, 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 and who's what. But um, there's just such an incredible misunderstanding. The fact is, 
that if you come to a Native community with any degree of respect at all, you're going to be head and shoulders ahead of what most people have come with. Uh, there's such an, a lack of knowledge about us. This actually happened a couple months ago at the university. One of the Asian people I work with approached me and said, hey, I seen an Indian on Broadway. The government gave him a new truck. I said, well, how do you know that? Well, he had a new truck. Well, how do you know he didn't work and buy his truck? Well, you guys don't work, do you? But the government gives you everything, don't they? That's what this man believed. I said, brother, don't you see me working with you here every day? I come in at nine o'clock, I go home at five. He said, yeah, but you're an exception. You want to work. This is what's out there. I mean, this is not extreme. This is the ignorance that is there. We need to educate ourselves about each other. And um, the, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, I forgot my last story. <laughs> Thank you. You know, one of the, um, one of the, uh, yeah, it's the old man's club kicking in, eh? The, uh, one of the, one of the themes that in this very rich morning that we've had as I was reflecting on these questions and these comments is what we have heard said in numerous different ways from different learned perspectives and insights are reflections on the significance, importance, and processes of knowing, of loving, and of doing, and the relationship between those three things. Now, those three aspects, knowledge, love, and will, are, of course, in the Baha'i teachings, the essential aspects of our spiritual nature itself. They are, you know, we say in our prayers every day, it's almost noon, I bear witness, O oh my God, that thou hast created me to know thee and to worship thee, love. I testify at this moment to my powerlessness and to thy might, to my poverty and to thy wealth. That's testifying, the action. Every day, Baha'is all over the world beseech God to give us strength to integrate, develop, nurture those three capacities. And what we've heard this morning are most brilliant and personal and stories and reflections on the dynamics of meeting that spiritual challenge individually, collectively, as a community, as communities coming together. So I would ask you all to once again thank our three panelists for the tremendous morning that they've shared with us.